welcome to The Room Podcast. I'm Claudia Lori, co-CEO and founder of Prive. And I'm Madison McElwain, partner of Seed Stage Investments at Defy VC. Claudia and I are friends first and business partners second. Living in the heart of Silicon Valley, we know what it's like to be on the inside of innovation, having worked at flagship companies like Gap Inc. and Uber. Now in our roles as a founder and a funder, we're changing the face of technology through our mission to bring more people into the room where it happens. With past guests such as Shikshir Merotra of Coda, Michelle Zatlin of Cloudflare, and Grammy award-winning Sierra, our past guests' companies are currently valued at over $73 billion. If you're a first-time founder or emerging funder who wants tactical insights into starting a company, venture capital funding, hiring, and more, this is the podcast for you. If you're new here, follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're interested in our weekly episode recap, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find at theroompodcast.com. Before we dive into this week's eye-opening episode, we have a short message from our sponsors. Support for The Room comes from Silicon Valley Bank. What's next? What if? Now what? Silicon Valley Bank understands these questions can keep founders up at night like Claudia. For over 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has helped high-growth companies through scalable financial solutions, plus insights and expertise that many other banks just can't. Which could be why 50% of U.S.-based, venture-backed tech and life science companies bank with SVB. Learn more at svb.com slash next. Silicon Valley Bank, built for what's next. Cooley is a global law firm built around startups and venture capital. The firm has been devoted to entrepreneurs and investors, partnering with both to transform breakthrough ideas into successful companies. Cooley works with thousands of entrepreneurs and newly formed companies to ensure that they are structured for growth and long-term success. Since 2005, Cooley has been ranked the number one most active law firm representing VC-backed companies going public. Learn more about the firm at Cooley.com and also at CooleyGo.com, Cooley's award-winning free legal resource for startups. We are so excited to welcome you back to the room for season five. Today, we sit down with Jeremy Tsai, CEO and founder of Italic. Italic is an online retailer that sells high-quality essentials from the same manufacturers as top brands for 50 to 80% less. Jeremy is on a mission to make quality affordable, but also to empower manufacturers to become merchants. On today's episode, we discuss the early founding firsts of Italic, the evolution of the Italic business model, and of course, the future of marketplaces in e-commerce. Let's open the door. Jeremy, thank you so much for being on The Room today. Yeah, it's a real honor to be here. Thanks so much for having me. We'd love to start at the beginning of your story. You were born in Illinois, and prior to having started Italic, You had family roots in the world of retail supply chain. Tell us about how your family's background in the manufacturing sector really influenced your early interests. I think I have your classic stereotypical founder story where I grew up in Chicago, moved to school out east, dropped out, moved to San Francisco. And growing up, you know, a lot of the the dinnertime conversations we had, for context, my parents started a manufacturing business maybe 40, 50 years ago. We would spend a lot of time talking about new clients, new equipment, new quality control, you know, new facilities, so on and so forth. And I think in, in typical founder fashion, definitely did not want to go do what my parents did. And manufacturing was the last thing that I thought I would kind of go back to doing. But you know, after my first business, which was enterprise HR software company called Fountain, um, really took off and I was four or five years in, I, I had a chance to kind of think about what I really wanted to do for a much longer period of time. And I think I really came back to those conversations I, I was having with my parents at the time and also kind of earlier childhood, just like remembering the, the interesting things about that. So there's a really big part in playing to the, the origination of Italic. I totally relate. My dad actually also works in venture and I never thought I would want to go into it. And ultimately here I am. And it's funny how you realize your dinner table conversations actually were really informative growing up into what you know and what you love today. So Jeremy, Italic was not your first business as a founder. Tell us about your time as a Teal Fellow and then the two subsequent startups. The Teal Fellowship really was a really cool experience that I think offered me two things in particular beyond just like, let's say just the money, which as you both know, going in San Francisco doesn't last very long. The first one was arguably the the, the most important for me, which was I think short term, it was really important from the standpoint of like, hey, I'm Asian kid with Asian parents and like 
School was really, really important. And to justify leaving you know, college, I, I'm technically even eight years later still on a leave of absence right now. Like It allowed me something reputable and prestigious, if you will, to point at and say to my parents, hey, I, I can stay out of school at least for these two years and see what happens. Let me give it a shot. You know, Beyond that, like obviously it allowed myself to kind of be financially independent for a little bit. The second, which really had longer lasting impact in, in my mind is I think as a founder, you, you quickly realize like how lonely of a journey it is. I mean, you know, Claudia, you, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's obviously helpful to have investors and friends and family and, and your team, of course. But at the end of the day, you're the founder. And I think it's really helpful to have a network of like-minded kind of founders who are going through it at the same period, same time. And also, most importantly, the same age as you, which I think the Tail Fellowship like uniquely offered, whereas most of the other founders I had known at the time you know, dropping out was like a, lot, a little bit less in vogue, if you will, back then. Really offered that uh, network of, of like-minded individuals and friends, which really offered kind of a support system beyond just like, let's say, the, the kids you went to high school with or, or grade school with. So not that that's not helpful by any means, but they just get it more. So I think that was really helpful. And then I guess going into the other two companies, like really the, the three main things I, I, I learned was, well, I, I learned a lot, obviously, from building a company in the first four. But I think that the most important of, of all was how important it matters that you care about what you do. My first company was called Fountain. Love the team to death. I realized like very quickly two years in is like, hey, you typically don't go into HR software. Like you don't drop out to work on enterprise software in the first place and let alone HR software. So I really wanted to do something that I was a lot more excited about in four or five years. And I, I finally had that opportunity to. And then I think the, you know, two other kind of quick things I I really learned was like the importance of team. I think there's a common saying of first time founders care about product, second time founders care about distribution. This is my third one. So I can say the third time you really care about the team most importantly, because that's who you're going to be spending time day in, day out with. And then I think the last one is just from a young founder perspective, oftentimes you're tricked not tricked, but induced into the ecosystem of like, oh, you have to pitch to these like very, very prestigious, you know, VCs. And that's like, you're earning the right to to build a company. When in reality, you know, a couple of times in, you realize like, actually, they're the ones who are lucky to be on this journey. It's clear that kind of your wisdom from the first two experiences has definitely kind of transferred to Italic and has certainly paid off. And just kind of hearing your learnings, just even personally, like, has caused like a moment of reflection. Like I am trying to focus on distribution and so many like early stage startup problems. But really with your first startup, Not Pot, you were disrupting bail payments. And then with Fountain, you were scaling hiring. And with Italic, you've really shifted to the world of e-commerce. And that might seem like a big sector shift from your first two experiences. Could you walk us through the early aha moments that ultimately led to embarking on founding Italic? The startup world that I guess I was thrown into and, and grew up in really was the the one where when like the Tim Ferriss MVP, you know, minimum viable product and, and lean startup was like very popular. And obviously nowadays, like there's very different mentalities around that and, and whatnot. But I think there's really two types of companies that, that are created. One is one where you kind of iterate your way through a number of problems and you're in many ways, like creating a startup for the sake of creating a startup. And there's nothing wrong with that. I obviously did that with Fountain. And, and I think that the second type really is like what people might classically call like a fat startup. I'm willing this thing into the world. And it takes a lot less, I guess, like iteration. And it's more like in order to get to step one, you have to basically cross a mountain to begin with. And a lot of examples, you obviously worked at Uber, you know exactly the challenges of a managed marketplace and the go to market kind of machinations of building infrastructure. But Italic very much was in the latter camp where it was founded off of a, a very clear thesis, which was manufacturing companies don't actually care about the direct-to-consumer client they're servicing or the legacy client they're servicing. If it's a Gap or an Everlane, it's one and the same to them, and they make margin the same exact way, which is cost plus, let's say, 15 to 20%. And then they sell it to a brand who sells it for five to 10 times. And really, I think the insight there was just like how Airbnb and, and Uber had kind of piloted these really novel new experiences in their respective categories, we think that marketplace disruption can happen in the same way, not on the brand side, like you see with an Amazon or on secondhand marketplaces, but actually on the product creation process. So the core insight was like, hey, these expensive products that these brands sell for a lot of money are expensive because the brands have to market them up many times to afford the retail distribution, afford you know selling direct to consumer for shipping, for Google and Facebook, and so forth. But the products themselves actually are pretty affordable for the majority of the world for high quality essentials. And that's like a very 
strong misalignment in terms of the where the value is being accrued in the supply chain. The Italic case specifically, the way we validated this really was twofold. One, most importantly, we are a supply-driven business. So we need merchants to come onto our platform, see the value proposition and get going. And, and the whole reason why manufacturers would do this as opposed to what they've been doing for many generations, oftentimes like 50 to 100 years, is really these are oftentimes family businesses, second generation, third generation owners. The newer generations want to innovate more with e-commerce. I think in our case specifically, manufacturers uh, are an incredibly low margin business. So here's an opportunity by selling on the Italic to actually double or triple the margins, the, the yield that they're receiving off their existing production capacity. And then on the flip side, I think for the uh, consumers, we needed to validate, okay, do people actually care about quality and price? And I think there's a lot of telltale signs that they do, and they also don't. Like in the case of luxury brands, there is no world where like you will replace buying a Prada handbag for an Italic handbag. But on the flip side, there's a lot of people who let's say, don't actually care about having that label on the product. And then what they're looking for is like the highest quality at the lowest possible price for that you know, products. I think in validating both of those, I, I could talk about like specific ways we were able to do that. The first year we pitched over 150 manufacturers, two said yes, so it was incredibly invalidating. But I think over time, and this is why I was bringing up like the, the vision led startups, it's you, you keep at it so long that the why and the mission and the vision like still persist. Otherwise, the second you have doubts around that, then I think that's when you probably should reevaluate. But for us, it, it persisted and we were able to get over that initial hurdle. And some startups just take longer to go to market. So we had to build a lot of that supply chain after the fact. That is incredibly interesting. And I love the highlight you made around where direct-to-consumer has initially shifted in the popular conversation of eliminating the need for a retailer to facilitate your purchase. And you're reframing that and saying, sure, that's great. Direct-to-consumer is helpful. It does eliminate the retailer. It ultimately lowers some cost to the end consumer. But let's take it a step further down the supply chain and say, we can eliminate the brand. You don't really even need them to be the middleman anymore. We can empower manufacturers to sell direct to consumer for the goods that they're selling that are providing the same experience for the end consumer that they would if they were being sold through. In that vision, which was quite bold, what, what was this, three, four years ago, Jeremy, when you were getting started here? Yeah, about three and a half. Yep. Three and a half years ago. You mentioned a lot of no's. That's a pretty grim no rate to uh, over 150. Who was the first manufacturer who did say yes to you on this bold vision you had? The first one was a small leather goods manufacturer that had produced for brands like Prada and, and Miu Miu and luxury brands. And really for, for them, they were more risk tolerant. So they were this was a, the fourth generation in, in the family. They were willing to take a shot on e-commerce. They had seen how it had transformed a, a lot of their clients' businesses. And, and as a manufacturer, you really have two ways to make more money. One is you get new clients, which in itself takes time. And it's also hard. And then two, you expand your business with your existing clients, but the downside is they'll then come to you and say, hey, like, can you lower the cost per unit? And that's a yearly, you know, conversation everyone has at the at every Q4. So I think for, for them, they saw us as a means, and we didn't understand this at the time, something I think a lot of first-time founders like really focus on or, or don't focus on is first of all, like sales. But then secondly, like when they do sales, typically a feature like, here's what we build. But look at all the stuff that we work so hard on when, in reality, like that's great and all, but what the point of the pitch is, is to kind of understand the problem deeply enough so that the solution actually directly caters to what the person is is, is hearing. And in our case, like on the manufacturer side, we were just saying, hey, we can do this, we can do that. When in reality, like what we were missing and why the first manufacturer took a chance on us really was centered around one, independence from the traditional supply chain, meaning instead of having to rely on existing wholesale, like here's a way where they could actually own a little bit more of their own destiny. Secondly was margin compression. So as a manufacturer, you're always dealing with your clients trying to squeeze you on cost, rising labor costs, rising material costs, rising rent, rising equipment costs, so on and so forth. So here's an opportunity to actually increase yield on your production lines without having to change anything. And then I think that the last one and arguably the, the most important one was here's a way that you can achieve essentially what your clients have, such as the brands, but we'll do all the hard stuff for you, such as the fulfillment, the marketing, the design, so on and so forth. A lot of the manufacturers nowadays, what we realized over time is they have really deep R&D competencies in-house. And a lot of the brands nowadays, the, the partners on the brand side will actually go to the manufacturer and just look at what they have in their showroom 
and then select styles that they'll reserve for their own brand. But in our case, like we can actually augment their existing R&D competencies by providing all the other kind of components of a brand so that they don't actually have to do that themselves. So those were the main kind of issues that manufacturers face today. And since then, we've gotten a lot, a lot better at refining the pitch and bringing merchants on, but it's taken a while to understand that. Are you open to sharing how many manufacturers you're working with today? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We work with about 70, ranging from a couple in Europe, a couple in Asia, and a couple in the States. Congratulations. From two to 70 in three years. That's amazing. Yeah, it's taken a while. <laughs> We've gotten better. You've added a whole suite of products that you now sell on Italic, but orient our listeners around what was that initial product that you did sell? Because what I'm hearing is there was this challenge in building the manufacturing relationships, but then once they said yes, you had to build it so that the consumers would come. Yeah, I think this is really the challenge of managed marketplaces because unlike you know peer play marketplaces where peers can work directly with one another, in a managed marketplace you have to build a tremendous amount of technology and infrastructure before you can deliver a single you know order or item. In our case, the challenge in marketplaces, managed or not, is also you're managing supply and demand and you're always constantly either over-indexed on supply or over-indexed on demand. So in our case, it's solving that chicken and egg problem in a balanced way that um, is constructive for the uh, merchants and we're not over-inundating them with supply relative to the demand that we can achieve for them. We've gotten a lot better at this in retail, especially Madison, as, as you know, Inventory can either make a business or it can really kill a business. And uh, and if you choose the wrong product, you can get stuck with it, it can dilute your brand, it can you have to run promos, so on and so forth. So we had to get pretty granular in terms of understanding the level of demand we saw for a product. And it's also amplified by the fact that it's not so simple as to say, hey, if we build this, will people buy it? Um, because people will often say, yes, I'll buy it. And then when it comes to the payment, like it, it won't necessarily reflect. To answer you very tangibly, we had uh, a set of leather handbags, we had cashmere scarves, and that was our initial assortment. Quickly found that the products that we had launched with aren't exactly what people wanted from a price point perspective. And we wanted to get a lot more aggressive on price point, And that's the whole purpose of the consumer value proposition. So we brought our margin down to basically negative um, to achieve like the most competitive prices we possibly could. That's when we really saw the uptake happen. And that's when we started launching new categories to validate, hey, is this just in handbags? Is this just in scarves? Or is this actually more powerful in other cases? And it turned out home goods nowadays actually performs better than fashion for us. Hearing you talk about managed marketplaces definitely throws me back to my time at Uber. And really, like one of the big reasons why I ultimately left Uber and went into e-commerce enablement was to bring a lot of the science and technology that we had built over there to the world of e-commerce. And I'm really curious about, and you mentioned this through like experimentation, just testing products. I'm curious about how you at Italic think about deciding what the product should be and what it should look like. Walk us through like the design process in terms of your product offering. When it comes to a physical product, it's always a blend of an art and science. And I think in our case, we tend to be a little bit less egotistical around like we, are, we know exactly what the customer wants and a little bit more around let's look at the market and look at the data and see what it tells us. In our case, we really focus around two segments. One is the categories and then two is a specific kind of feature feature sets and designs that people want. And the categories, we look at it from a high level basis. We have a constant kind of customer panel. We run consumer insights constantly. We run surveys at every single touch point, whether you're joining or you're exiting. And really, I think what we uh, care about is, hey, if we launch this category, what is the incremental lift to our ability to acquire the next customer or our incremental ability to retain our existing customer and expand their you know, lifetime value with us? And it can get pretty granular in the sense of, hey, if we if we launch beauty, we believe we can lift our AOVs and LTVs from a take rate and expansion perspective by like X percent and, uh, and also increase our ability to convert people off of the email subscription list who previously haven't purchased by like X percent because they've indicated as such. So that's from a, a higher level uh, way to triangulate around which categories we should enter. And then in terms of once we've uh, found that, we try to do a lot of market research and customer research around what are the brands that people and customers actually like to purchase, not just the, the hot ones that are popular in bi-coastal cities like LA and New York throughout the entire country. What are the things that they care about on those products? So for example, in our luggage, do people actually want a removal battery? And it turns out like 
it was very split evenly. 50% were vehemently against it. 50% were like, yeah, it'd be nice to have. It's things like that, that we try to provide that information through technology to our merchants. And we build a lot of data orchestration to pipe that data from our customers to our what we, what we call our internal product, which is the merchant portal. We want to eventually make the development process autonomous, essentially with the same level of data granularity as top brands, but it'll just take a little bit of time to, to get there. I'm definitely split down the middle on the battery question because I think it's so <laughs> practical and helpful, but then they always yell at you when you try to get on the plane with your battery in your bag now. I'm a no battery person. You're no battery. Okay. We heard it here first. Jeremy's no battery. It's just been incredible to see both the, you already shared, you 70 merchants and, and manufacturers that are now on the platform and then the number of customers and products that you're offering. You have been building this for three and a half years and your initial two startups, I believe, were venture-backed as well. But when you went off to start Italic, was venture the first step in terms of thinking about how you were going to get this off the ground? That's a good question. For Italic specifically, we knew that this was going to be an infrastructurally intensive, capitally intensive business. But more importantly, I think is the reason why. And, and I think that's actually a question that like every founder should ask themselves. Obviously, the capital markets right now are a great time to be raising. There's more capital and more diversity and more money and you know available today than ever before. So if you're getting off the ground, you know, and, and you have a good reason to raise money, then I think this is a great time to do it. But I think that question of, hey, should you or what is the reason why you should is really important. In the case of Italic, this is something that I think is true for unique types of businesses. One of the most popular phrases we talk about in tech is economies of scale. And like nine times out of 10, I, I'm pretty sure that's like actually not true. I'll give you a, a tangible example. In the case of Uber, it doesn't actually matter if Uber works great in San Diego if it doesn't exist in Chicago but to someone who lives in Chicago. There's a lot of, I think, local market difficulties that don't necessarily result to pure economies of scale. Whereas in the case of manufacturing, it is like that's the textbook definition of economies of scale, the more volume you drive, the cheaper each unit gets. How that relates to Italic is we really benefit tremendously from scale in every single sense of the word, from our fulfillment costs to the product quality, to the product prices, to our ability to serve our customers, to the support team, to the degree where in order for Italic as a business to work, it actually has to be big and there's no other way around that. And if it can't get big, then you know we probably don't have a business here. So mm. that's a justification in terms of, hey, we want to build this in a capitally intensive way because we believe the stronger consumer experience from a managed marketplace that benefits from scale will supersede doing it in a more lightweight, you know, bootstrapped way. I would also encourage any listener out there to really be deliberate about raising because the second you raise, like you're basically signing up for a five, 10 year journey at minimum. And that's what I realized with Fountain. So really be you know, cautious because if you are a solo founder, it's kind of, it's pretty hard to get out. That is an incredible point and a great piece of feedback for any listener who's thinking about embarking initially on their venture journey for scaling their company. And I have to say, congratulations for all the success you have had going through this capital financing path. I believe you've raised over 50 million in venture dollars from incredible firms for like Index Ventures and Canaan Partners. Just curious, who was the person who first said yes to backing your vision for Italic? Yeah, it's actually kind of a funny story. Blake at Ludlow has been a good friend for a long time. He, back when I think he was still in college and I had just dropped out, he was the first VC Keith and I had ever pitched. And he was also the first no we ever received. It came full circle because, you know, when I had left Fountain, I was able to talk to a couple investors and just talk through the idea. And they were almost instinctively just without even a huge amount of proof needed, like they were the first yes. And I'm obviously lucky in the sense that I had time to build my network in, in San Francisco and had some proof points in the past with uh, with Fountain and so on and so forth. So I'm in a very grateful to be in a unique position when it comes to financing and then know that not everyone can do that. But that was our first yes and very grateful. Uh, I don't think we'd be around in the same way if it weren't for Blake and Ludlow. As an entrepreneur myself, hearing about those kind of early no's and then now we're like talking again to investors, it's funny how small the community is and how a no a year ago or two years ago can quickly turn into a yes in a different context. So it's really cool to hear that story. We chatted a little bit about venture funding. We chatted about scaling the business. 
We also mentioned kind of negative margins. Would love to dig into your early business model a little bit. So Italic, if I have it correctly, initially started with a membership model. So you would pay monthly or yearly in order to access the platform. But recently you announced that a customer no longer has to be a member to shop on the platform. Tell us a little bit about what you were thinking through with your early membership model and ultimately why you guys are shifting away from it right now. Really, it came down to two things. As is the case with every startup, I'll also have the humility to say, hey, like we don't uh, always have the answers. And it is very possible that this evolution may or may not be the right call. But time will tell, and it's going to really depend on execution and strategy. But the reasons for the shift really are twofold. One is going back to the earlier point around scale. Originally, to set the competitive prices we wanted to, we would lose money on pretty much every single order. And that's why we needed a high margin membership to essentially compensate for the losses we were seeing on the orders. Now with scale, like products get cheaper to make, even though you're maintaining the same quality and experience, if not better. We simply got to the volume where in most of our product categories, we were starting to see margin and so were our manufacturers and they were happy about the additional scale. We were able to remove the membership with from being a necessity to purchase to now being an optional upgrade, and we would still be able to, as a business, make money in both scenarios. Uh, the second reason really was more kind of a mission alignment, which was we really want to uh, essentially empower everyone to have a way to purchase high quality products and to live well as a result of that. And as a function, we really depend, our business is really dependent on the concept of the more customers we have, the more ability we can, the more leverage we have to go to our man- manufacturers and bring them on to expand our product portfolios, to bring on new merchants who previously might not have said yes. And the result of all those new merchants is we can offer new products and expanded products that our customers previously wanted or uh, potential customers might have wanted. Having the membership as a paywall, essentially, from people being able to try Italic was actually shooting us in the foot a little bit. Hey, we're intentionally gating the number of customers we're letting through that flywheel. Whereas in the new model, the membership is an optional upgrade where it actually improves upon your shopping experience, but it's not necessary to shop. So we want it to be great to shop without a membership and even better to shop with one. It's really cool to see like over the past few years in e-commerce how there's just so many new ways to shop, whether it be a solely kind of membership access to platform method or a subscription box, for example, or a blended method where you can pay for additional benefits. I'm curious, what do you think the next like big innovation is going to be in terms of end consumers actually shop online? Yeah, I think it's really going to be two things. So if the past decade was direct to consumer, meaning the retailer was disintermediated, I really do think the rise of the, the terminology hasn't really been crystallized yet. Some people call it from uh, you know manufacturer to consumer. I, I really do think there's going to be more companies that essentially disintermediate the brands and retailers and go connect the consumer straight to the manufacturer. And Italic actually is not the first, let alone the, the biggest example of this. We're leading the front from the managed marketplace perspective and in the premium goods side, but Shein, which kind of caught everyone uh, by surprise, is doing $10 billion a year to a Western market and with product that whether you, you like it or hate it, like people will purchase. And that's not a brand that has a legacy or heritage is something like a Louis Vuitton. Also, the second kind of fastest growing segment in retail besides secondhand, which is first, is private label. So in the past 10 years, private labels in Walmart, Target, Amazon, so on and so forth. Target alone has 15 brands in-house that do over a billion dollars each. I really think the concept of value will continue to expand in importance, especially as consumers get more intelligent and aware and and educated around like where their products come from and the prices they can pay for that type of quality. You see this with the wire cutter and and other Reddit and and blogs and and so on and so forth and increasingly improving the customer intelligence. And then I think on the flip side, you know, on the brands, um, Italic stance isn't that brands are going away or that we're trying to replace them. Instead, we're trying to offer a value-oriented solution for every single segment. But like we said in the start, if you're going to buy a product bag, you're going to buy the product bags. We think emotional purchases are going to be increasingly experiential. You see this in every single luxury brand in Europe right now and the kind of crazy stuff that they're doing, which is really cool in terms of making the shopping experience more fun. I think more like, a, I guess, a, a technological standpoint of that is I expect to see more fun services like live shopping, which I know is really has taken off lately in real life pop ups, so on and so forth. Right now, I think that's limited predominantly to the coasts and big cities. But I think that'll start creeping up throughout the, the rest of um, the states and really just like having more fun with shopping. Right now, I think 
this Western commerce really reflects back to like how Asian commerce looks looked like in 2015. It was predominantly really, frankly, like boring shopping experiences. And now I think it's going to be hopefully in the next five years disintermediated into value based shopping that's very rational and probably, frankly, as, as well, boring, but smart and makes you feel good. And then also emotional experiences that really serve the, the need of kind of buying into stories and, and whatnot. You just articulated an incredible vision for what the next five to 10 years for commerce could look like, which is something both Claudia and I are actively thinking about in our day jobs. And the concept of heritage, which you brought up, has actually been a theme we've been exploring since the beginning of this podcast. Our second guest was uh, Coral Chung of Senrev. And similar to what you built with Italic, they have rebranded what heritage can feel like as a modern heritage brand. Italic to me has so many similar ways in which it can relate to customers to say you deserve the value, but you don't need to pay this insane price. What has that reaction been like from your consumers and how does it bolster the future for Italic for you thinking about providing opportunity to access luxury in a new way? First of all, I'm a really big fan of Sunrev and, and Coral. I think they've built up what is admittedly Um, a great business in an impossibly hard market. One of the hardest markets to target, which is extremely design dependent and really material dependent. And I think they've done it in a really smart way. In our opinion, um, you know, we compete with everyone. And as a result of that, we don't compete with anyone. Meaning if you want to buy a bag from Italic, it's not like there is one other place to buy a bag. There are thousands and same goes for Sunrev and Monster Gabriel and so many of these other kind of you know, handbag focused companies, our opinion really is that brand matters uh, tremendously. It's one thing to say that you are building a new kind of generational business and and brand, but like another to actually compete. If someone wants to buy a handbag, they can buy from the legitimate heritage brands such as like Prada or Versace or whatever it is. And it's impossible, frankly, to replicate that type of legacy in a matter of two, three years. Those have been around for 50 to 100 years. I think on the flip side, if you're looking for a modern, fresh take on that, a lot of the new crop of direct-to-consumer brands have done a great job on this. Instead of buying a Ramoa, you can buy an Away luggage. Instead of buying All Cloud, you can buy a Caraway. People will always want value-based products. Our opinion is that design matters a lot and brand matters a lot, but there's two types of brands. One is a brand that specifically refers to the model itself, so buying low and selling high. Italic is not a brand. We are a marketplace that connects mm-hmm. high-end manufacturers directly to end consumers. But the second, I guess, like definition of brand is like the expectation of consistency from the experience that you're purchasing. And a good example of that is like Uber or Airbnb, where they don't, you're not booking like an Uber driver, they're connecting you to a local kind of driver. You're not booking an Airbnb owned or managed hotel, you're but they're just connecting you to that. And they've really built, I think, unique brand images and awareness around that type of platform. And I think that's what we really want to build as well. The expectation of what to receive, which is a really high quality product for a really great price point, but doing that across many categories. Jeremy, I have to ask out of curiosity, what is your favorite product that's available to purchase on Italic today? Yeah, I'm biased. I live in Park City, Utah, so it gets pretty cold and definitely like skiing. So the the product that I personally like the most, to be honest, is our shearling moccasin slippers for, for men and women. It's snowing right now, so <laughs> I am wearing them and they're awesome. And they're also really affordable. I have a couple pairs. Holiday wish list shout out right there. I was definitely eyeing those earlier. And I also loved how you said that home is such a good category for you because I was also eyeing the marble cheese platter. So yeah, maybe catch that in my cart later. (laughs) We've talked, Jeremy, all about the journey you've been on as an individual to get to where Italic is today. And then also the twists and turns, both from the manufacturer's side, the customer side, and ultimately the vision for the future. There's a really interesting, unique challenge we're all facing as consumers, but also I'm sure as suppliers, which is the current supply chain crisis we're having. You can't really watch the news or honestly, for me, go to Starbucks without feeling the impact as a consumer. How has this impacted Italic right now? I think it affects everyone. So in our case, I'll respond very tangibly. 
freight costs have gone up a lot. And in some of the lower ticket items or bulkier items, I would definitely expect prices to rise, not just with Italic, but literally across the entire industry. In other cases, we've the pace at which we're accelerating scale and volume to our merchants oftentimes will overcompensate for the rise in prices. So across the entire categories and catalog, I would say we're definitely seeing a little bit of inflation in terms of uh, price point. But I think overall, like we're seeing actually deflationary prices in, in some categories when everyone else is going up. And because of that larger volume, kind of efficiencies gained on price point. And then on the flip side, when bulkier or heavier products, like we're definitely seeing that um, kind of price go up as well. I think my main encouragement to everyone listening is go holly shopping early this year. And hopefully this will come to pass. But there's it also calls into attention like the fragility of kind of the global supply chain as it is right now in terms of our reliance on freight brokers. Yeah, it, it's certainly a, a challenge for us and everyone. What advice would you give to a founder who maybe is less seasoned or less experienced than you at embarking in building a business in the global commerce ecosystem, given the uh, challenges this crisis has brought? This is, I think, not just true for e-commerce or retail founders. I, like every one of my peers, thought like culture was this like fuzzy MBA BS thing. It turns out it's actually like the single most important thing you as a founder and your company can be deliberate about protecting and deciding on early on. I really would encourage first-time founders especially to you know, really be deliberate as early as possible about the type of company you want to build because ultimately that's going to dictate the type of people who come through the door. You also have a choice in terms of who you want to bring in through the door. You don't have to, just because someone has a great resume or great experience, you could have the best growth in the world, the best perks, the best office, so on and so forth. But if you have coworkers you don't enjoy spending time with, your work is still going to suck, I promise you. So <laughs> I would really be deliberate about team and culture as early as possible. And every founder makes this mistake. That's really, I think, more important than anything I could say on e-commerce specifically. That is incredible advice. And I'm sure Claudia is taking fastidious notes as I know she's hiring for anyone listening to this podcast. Okay. And our last two questions, Jeremy, the first of which is really, you shared a lot about what's going on with Italic and what's next for the business, but we're excited to know what's next for you. I think really for me, it's, I'm no longer as, I, I'm still very young, relatively speaking, but like, I'm no longer like new kid on the block with like super clear eyes and that perspective. And a lot of the things you, you can make decisions on early on, I think really have compounding effects in terms of how you kind of come to see the world and also work and, and operate. Going forward, I hope to become a better leader in, in every sense of the word. Feedback is not something that you should have to feel defensive or protective about. It's something that you should embrace with open arms. And it's up to you whether you decide it's feedback to act on or to reject based on your value system. But I think ultimately it's stuff that will really allow you to work better. Your job as a founder and my job as a founder is not to do everything for everyone, but rather to build the team and to lead the team um, and motivate the team to accomplish the goals that we set out to do. And in the case of Italic, we have a whole lot that we want to do, including new category expansion like skincare and food and beverage, and also ex expanding our merchant footprint and, and infrastructure we can offer to them. On a more personal note is I think early on when you're super young and, and doing this, like you put the company above all else and you make that your life and your identity. In many ways, yeah, it is, of course, like you signed up for that and that's what you know, you're going to be thinking about 24 seven, but make sure, I, I think for me, like something that I'm going to try to be a lot more deliberate about is protecting my own kind of personal time and, and time with my loved ones and relationships and, you know, so on and so forth and making sure that I don't let that go to the wayside. Your, your job is to not have your hands on everything, but rather to be in a great mental space and physical space to be the leader that the company deserves. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for sharing that and just sharing your whole entire journey. We're incredibly excited for what's to come with Italic, but also for you as a leader. We'd love to ask our closing question, which we ask on every podcast episode, which is who is a woman in your life that has had a profound impact on your career? In my case, it is my mom because without her starting, my mom actually started the manufacturing business and my dad works for her. Without her doing that, one, I wouldn't be working in Itel. And then two, I also wouldn't have kind of that, I guess, founder spirit that was embedded in me from an early age. So I can give the whole like immigrant story and whatnot, but I, I think that is really important for kind of me and, and Italic. And then secondly is so my, my partner, Katie. I've been with her for six years. Being a partner of a founder, like honestly speaking, like it sucks. It's basically a free co-founder is the way I've come to understand it. <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that. 
Thank you so much, Jeremy, for being on the room today. It was awesome to have you um, on and to hear your story. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, best of luck. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Room Podcast. We also hope to see you next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific for another episode of The Room Season 5. Please like, subscribe, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse, Discord. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, we'll see you next week in The Room for another inspiring conversation. See you later. Support for The Room comes from Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank understands these questions can keep founders up at night like Claudia. For over 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has helped high growth companies through scalable financial solutions, plus insights and expertise that many other banks just can't. Which could be why 50% of US-based venture-backed tech and life science companies bank with SVB. Learn more at svb.com slash next. Silicon Valley Bank, built for what's next. Cooley is a global law firm built around startups and venture capital. Since forming the first institutional venture fund in Silicon Valley, Cooley has formed more venture capital funds than any other law firm in the world. The firm has 60 plus years working with VCs, helping form managed funds, make investments, and to handle the myriad of issues that arise through a fund's lifetime. Learn more about the firm at Cooley.com and also at CooleyGo.com. Cooley's award-winning free legal resource for startups. All opinions expressed by Claudia and Madison and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of the 5EC. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. 